My name is George Michel. I'm trained as an architect, and when I was a young student, I managed to come to India and visited many ancient sites, one of which was this Badami region. Later in my life, I decided to pursue an interest in ancient Indian architecture, and my first project were the temples in the Badami region. I went to London to study. I had come from Australia, and they asked me, why do you want to study the temples in the Badami area? And I had to justify this topic. Nobody in London seemed to know much about Badami many, many years back, and I said, here, in this part of India, we have the earliest, best-preserved Hindu temples. Not only rock cut, but also built structurally out of sandstone. And they are really worth studying, not only because they are so well preserved, but because they are built in different styles. And this is the only part of India where temples are built in different styles next to each other. This is because there were different groups of craftsmen and builders who came to work under the Chalukyas. So we're dealing with a period that goes back to the 6th century, so 1400 years ago, when the Chalukyas were the most important rulers of this part of the Deccan, of the peninsular part of India. The Chalukyas ruled for about 200 years till the middle of the 8th century. They were the most powerful and wealthy people, and they built extensively. So at Badami and at other nearby places like Mahakuta, Patadakal, Aiholi, we have this huge range of temples which can be visited to this day. And they are really the glory of this part of what is now modern Karnataka. So my first project was to go with a photographer and some fellow architects and make measured drawings of these temples. And this I did, and by making drawings, you have to remember this is in the days before electronic measuring, we were measuring with tapes, ladders, pencils, tracing paper, I got to know the different types of temple architecture. And not only cave temples, but also, as I said, structural temples. So let me give you a, an idea of what to be found in each of these places. If you go to Badami today, you'll be amazed at what a really beautiful place this is. It has a red sandstone setting. There's like a sort of a horseshoe of cliffs containing a tank, an artificial reservoir, green colored, which was created by the Chalukyas when they made this place, Badami, or as they called it then, Vatapi, their capital of their kingdom. And in the cliffs above the town, they cut into the rock to create these um, artificial grottos, or what we call cave temples. There are four of them on the south cliff. One of them is dedicated to Shiva, two of them are dedicated to Vishnu, and one is a Jain cave, which shows you the different cults that were being sponsored by the Chalukya kings at this time. And they are glorious because they are very well preserved, the stone is very fine, and the carvings inside these cave temples are really spectacular. The interesting thing about cave temples is that they reproduce the forms of actual buildings. They have columns, they have brackets, they have beams. They look like a wooden mandapa or a wooden hall, but actually they're monolithic. They're cut completely out of the rock. And on their surfaces, we have carvings in relief, we have designs, we have gods, we have goddesses. Now, the first cave at Badami is de dedicated to Shiva. And outside the cave, we have a spectacular dancing Shiva image with 18 arms, one of the earliest and most complete images of dancing Shiva. Inside the cave, we have different aspects of Shiva shown on the walls of the cave and also on the ceilings. And there, there's a little Nandi placed inside the cave. If you go further up the cliff, we come to a great Vishnu cave. And this is very interesting historically because it has an inscription giving us the date which works out to be 578. 
of the year 500 in their calendar of that time, but 578 in our calendar. And this great Vishnu shrine was a royal monument. We know that the king asked for it to be excavated, and his brother was in charge of having it cut. And when you go into the cave at one end, you will see Vishnu seated on a coiled serpent with the hoods of the serpent raising above his head. And on the other end of the veranda, you will see the god Vishnu as Narasimha, as the man-lion, leaning on the club. They are magnificent carvings, larger than human size, and almost freely cut out of the rock in three dimensions. If you look up at the ceilings, you will see a coiled naga, a coiled serpent. You will also find traces of painting, because these caves were painted inside, but most of the paint has actually disappeared today. We have no image in the little sanctuary deep within the cave. This has long ago disappeared. Further up the steps, when you climb up the cliff, you come to the Jain cave. and this cave <clears throat> was commissioned by a Jain merchants who were working under the Chalukyas at the time and we have these seated Tiatankaras or seated um, um, saviors, Jain saviors cut into the rock. So it is a very interesting, I would say, spectrum of different religious cults all towards the end of the 6th century. So Shaivite, Vaishnavite and Jain. On the other side of the city, now it's quite a big place, Badami, um, we have temples that were constructed, that is built out of cut blocks of local sandstone and assembled one block placed upon the other, so constructed temples. And these are no longer completely preserved, they have been ruined. And we haven't got a proper explanation why they're ruined, but it's possible that when the Badami Chalukyas invaded the Tamil Pallava kingdom, the Pallavas retaliated. They came back to the Badami area and they invaded and occupied the city and they might have destroyed some of the temples of the Chalukyas at that time. This happened towards the middle of the 7th century. Anyhow, on top of the north cliff, facing down onto the, onto the town, we have what's called the Upper Shivalya, the Upper Shiva Temple. And it's very important architecturally because it's built in what we call the Dravida style. Dravida is a name for southern India. And this type of temple is recognizable because it has a pyramidal tower in stories. So each story gets less and less, and at the top we have a kuta. We have a sort of like a curved square type of um, capping roof piece. So the upper Shivalya preserves one of these rooftops. So it's an early 7th century constructed temple. And if we go further around this cliff, we find a better preserved temple called the Maligiti Shivalya. And this is of the same type, but it has an octagonal curved top, completely preserved. Maybe the Pallava invaders didn't see it. So these are very important temples. Now the Maligiti Shivalya is interesting because it has a sculpture of Shiva on one side and a sculpture of Vishnu on the other side, both beautifully preserved. It would seem that a Shiva temple could have images of different gods on its outer walls. Just because you worship Shiva didn't mean you couldn't also pay respect to Vishnu or any other gods. And along the bottom of the temple, we have a sort of basement with mouldings, we have little imps, or gunners as we call them, which are auspicious, pot-bellied creatures who represent the uh, treasures of the earth, and they're extremely good luck to have in every temple. At the end of the tank of the reservoir at Badami, we have a temple that overlooks the water, and it's an extremely pleasant place to sit. We all go and have our picnics there when we visit Badami. This is a slightly later temple, maybe late 7th, early 8th century, we're not quite sure. And it has a porch in front with nice balcony and sloping, angled roof slabs like this, 
probably added in the 9th or 10th century when the Chalukyas were gone, but other kings came, like the Rashtrakutas, who also built temples. So this gives you an idea of the type of things to be seen in Badami today. It's quite a busy town, it's growing quickly, and we're all concerned that these monuments should be well looked after. But Badami is not the only town in this area. Badami is like gateway to the Chalukya kingdom, heartland. And this heartland is marked by a river called the Malprabha River that runs through a valley. It goes from near to Badami, about 25 kilometers through this valley, bounded by cliffs, very lush, very well ir irrigated, all the way to Aiholi at the other end. <clears throat> now the next site I should have something to say about is Mahakuta. Mahakuta can be reached from Badami. You can walk from Badami across the top of the cliff down into this small sacred place. And the interesting thing about Mahakuta, it is still in worship after almost 12, 13, or shall we say even 1400 years. The focus of Mahakuta is a tank, is a reservoir fed by a natural spring. The water comes bubbling up from underneath, so the water is extremely clear and very nice to swim in. And so lots of young men, they all plop into the water, and there's lots of splashing and noise. But the, the um, Mahakuta tank is overlooked by a number of temples, all consecrated to Shiva. It's a sacred Shaiva place of worship. And the interesting thing about Mahakuta is that we have temples in different styles. The most important temple here, the Mahakuteshvara temple, is built in the southern or the Dravida style. And it has this pyramidal type of tower. Each level is a different story with, with um, overhangs and little colonnettes, capped by an octagonal to dome roof. And in it is a linga that is being worshipped today, that has been worshipped probably from the late 6th or the early 7th centuries. Next to it are several small shrines, also dedicated to Shiva, but completely different in style. They have curving towers. They look like this. And we call this style of tower Nagara. And by Nagara we mean North Indian. And these towers have little sort of horizontal divisions. And at the top is a circular capping piece, which we call an Amalaka, which has ribs like this. And this is typical of the Nagara style. It doesn't appear that the Nagara temples are earlier or later than the Dravida temple, but they were built at the same time. And you may ask, how is it the temples in different styles came to be built at places like Mahakuta? And I'll tell you later about Patadakal. The Chalukyas ruled a vast territory of what is now Karnataka, Maharashtra and parts of Andhra. When the Pallavas invaded Badami, they had to seek refuge slightly to the north. And they left Badami for about 20, 25 years and came into contact with other artistic and architectural traditions. And what is likely to have happened is that when they returned to Badami, having expelled the Pallavas, reclaimed their capital and their kingdom, they brought with them architects and craftsmen who had worked in different traditions influenced by northern India. And so it was, we imagine, that there were different groups of architects, designers and builders working side by side and the Chalukya kings obviously enjoyed this variety of architecture in their sacred places. And this is the great interest that we have in Mahakuta. If you continue down the Malaprabha River, the next site to be visited is called Patadakal. And Patadakal is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is a recognition of the architectural and historical importance of the great temples that still stand there. The temples all face east onto the Malaprabha River which is right there, and the Malprabha River at this point is running north. North flowing water in this part of India is very auspicious 
because it seems to lead towards the Himalayas in the distant north. So it was a very sacred place so that the temples can face towards the rising sun as well as towards the waters which are running to the north. And the temples of Patadakal were all royal monuments and we have the names of the kings who built them at different times and they are all built by, as commemorative monuments. In fact, two of them were built by queens of um, Vikramaditya, one of the great Chalukya kings, after he had won a battle against the Pallavas. And when he came back in the 730s, early 8th century, his two sister queens built two matching temples to commemorate this victory. Today they are called the Virupaksha and Malikarjuna temples. And they are built in a very advanced, sophisticated Dravida style, extremely complicated, with again these pyramidal towers capped by square or octagonal domes. Now these two temples are extremely large and they have huge halls, or mandapas as we call them, each with 16 columns entered through porches on three sides. And when you go into the temple, you see these corridors with columns, and on the columns are various carvings of stories, narratives, and myths, including ones that we recognize easily, like the story of Krishna, various episodes from the Ramayana, and even from the Mahabharata. And as you walk through these corridors, you come to the Linga shrines, one of which in the Virupaksha temple is still under worship. In front of both of these temples are pavilions for Nandi. Only the one in Virupaksha temple is still intact. There's a huge Nandi there today and it's very popular when people come to worship at this temple. They always go and present something to the Nandi and then they proceed into the temple to worship at the Linga. The Malikarjuna temple is a little more ruined, so that's not possible. Next to the Malikarjuna temple, we have a quite different structure, one again that's in the Nagara style with this curved type of tower. In the language of North Indian architecture, we call this a shikara, or a peak, a mountain peak. And this shikara type temple, it's uh, called Kashi Vishwanath, after the great temple in Banaras and it was also built by the Chalukyas more or less at the same time. So again, as we had in Mahakuta, we have here in Patadakal temples in quite different styles built very close together apparently by parallel groups of workmen from different traditions. Now the sculptures on the Virupaksha and Malikarjuna temple are extremely diverse. We have lots and lots of images of Shiva in all his different aspects, but not all the sculptures are of gods and goddesses. As you enter the temples at the porches, you have couples, human couples, and they are dressed in courtly costumes, probably of the fashion of the day, and they greet you as you come into the temple, and, they, and they're extremely interesting because they give an idea of how people must have dressed during that time. If you walk a few meters along the river, you come to another temple called the Papanat. This is also dedicated to Shiva and faces towards the river. But what is interesting about this temple is that here the two styles start to come together. They are no longer separated and we have the impression that builders and craftsmen in the Dravida tradition and those in the Nagara tradition are starting to work together. So the outer walls of this temple, which is a very long temple, they have um, Dravida type features with little arches, but they have a, um, also Nagara type features combined together. So now we have a fusion of two different styles. And this doesn't occur anywhere else in India. So it is really quite interesting because obviously these two groups were asked to come together to create a temple that was different to any other. The outer walls of this temple are very interesting because they have sculptures um, illustrating legends. 
Um, the, the whole of the south wall of the temple is the Ramayana. And here we have all legend, the legend leading up to the climactic battle between Ravana and Ramana and then Rama's enthronement back at Ayodhya. And each panel has a little label identifying the principal figures so that we can be sure what scene is depicted there. Furthermore, there is even the occasional label of the artist who actually sculpted the scene. And these are among the earliest um, identifications that we have of actual craftsmen working on a temple. Inside the temple, we again have this um, mandapa, these type of halls with beautifully carved columns leading towards the Linga sanctuary. And as in the cave temples, we have magnificent ceiling panels. This was a speciality of Chalukya architecture and art. And among the themes that we find here are the coiled nagas with little human torsos like this, surrounded by coiled bodies, and dancing Shiva. And these, these type of themes go throughout the temple sculpture and art of the Chalukyas. If we continue further down the Malprabha Valley, we eventually come to a town called Aiholi. Now, Aiholi was never a capital city of the Chalukyas as far as we understand. It was a sort of commercial town and it was famous for its guilds. And there is a guild called the Ayavole 500 or the 500 merchants of Aiholi. And inscriptions throughout South India mention this particular group of merchants who came from Aiholi. So obviously it was an extremely important city. So we have Badami, which was like the capital of the Chalukyas, where they must have had their palace, we guess. Nothing is left today. We have Patadakal, which was a ceremonial place where the kings had temples built and also queens, to commemorate victories. And further down the valley, we had the city of Aiholi, which was extremely wealthy. And the interesting thing about Aiholi is that it had a life after the early Chalukyas. So even after the Chalukyas are displaced by the Rashtrakutas in the middle of the 8th century, the city goes on to have a life under the Rashtrakutas and the later Chalukya kings, the kings of that area who also called themselves Chalukyas. With the result that there are temples in Aiholi from the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th centuries. It's crowded with temple. It really is a sort of temple town. And until recently, the temples were all, uh, were all encroached upon by mud houses. And when I first went there many years back, people were even living in the temples. Now the site has been cleared, there's barbed wire, there are lawns, there are tickets, the temples are now cleared, and you can see them really properly. Now the interesting thing about Aiholi is that the temples there are built again in many different styles. The, um, on top of the hill overlooking the town, um, the hill is called Meguti, is a Jain temple. It's often called the Meguti temple because of the hill. It is dated, which is very important because very few temples have exact dates. This has an inscription which works out at 634 in our era, which is a very early date. It's a Dravida style temple which means that it would have had a pyramidal tower, except much of the tower was dismantled in later times. Interestingly, it is a Jain temple. So obviously the Chalukyas at that time uh, um, had very important, they were not themselves Jain, but they must have had very important Jain um, people in their community. Probably they were the merchants and financiers, and thus they were able to build temples dedicated to these Tirtankaras, or Jain saviors. The inscribed panel on the temple walls, which gives the date, is written in Sanskrit, which was not the language that was spoken, of course. It was a very um, high courtly language. It's in beautiful language, and it mentions Kailedasa, who was the famous poet of northern India. In fact, it's the earliest reference to Kailedasa in the literature of India. 
Kalidasa lived earlier, but this is the first recorded instance mentioning him. And this was written by the court poet who was named, and obviously this inscribed slab was extremely important for the king, the Jain patron, and the whole culture of the Chalukyas at that time. Now, if you go up the hill, you climb up the hill, you visit the Jain temple, and you look over the walls surrounding the temple, you will see these various curious stone objects that look like tables. They have upright stones and horizontal stones. They look like picnic tables. And these are megalithic tombs. This shows that the Iholi site was inhabited two and three thousand years ago. So it's a very ancient place that under the, under the Chalukyas was converted into a town of considerable size and wealth. Coming down the hill and going into the town, you come to the main group of temples, and the largest temple in this area is called the Durga Temple. <clears throat> it is not dedicated to the goddess Durga, because the word Durg in this part of India means a watchtower or a sort of a fort. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, this temple was converted into a lookout post. And the very earliest photographs we have of this temple show that the tower was converted into a watchtower looking out for the enemies that were invading this part of India. So it is a temple that was probably dedicated to Surya, the sun god. And it's extremely unusual. Instead of being laid out on a square, like most temples, it's laid out with a part circle. It has this type of configuration at the back. It's a bit like the Buddhist Chaitya shrines that some of you may know from the rock-cut monuments at, let's say, Ajanta. Anyhow, it's not Buddhist, but it must share this same type of architecture with earlier Buddhist architecture. When you come into the temple, you have a veranda with columns, and on the columns, again, we have these human couples. And these couples, again, are auspicious, they're very good luck, they are embracing each other, they're dressed in courtly costumes with wonderful jewellery, wonderful hairstyles. And you enter the temple, and then you go around the temple inside a veranda. And as you wander around through this veranda, you will see on your right side, because you're proceeding in a clockwise direction, various panels of various gods and goddesses. And here you can see a complete range of deities. You have Vishnu as Narasimha. You have Vishnu riding on Garuda. You have Shiva dancing. You have Durga spearing the buffalo demon. You have like a sort of a complete spectrum of different deities. And when you go inside the actual temple, into the dark sanctuary, you come to a circular pedestal where the original deity was worshipped. We think Surya, but sadly today, nothing is left. A short distance from the Durga temple, if you walk outside the town, you come to a cave temple. Because here at Aiholi, we also have rock-cut architecture. This is called the Rock of Ravana, the Ravana Padi, as they call it locally. And it's in beautiful condition. It probably goes back to the late 7th, early 8th century. We're not exactly sure. And in it, we have lots of images of Shiva. But the finest carved relief inside the Ravana Padi shows Shiva dancing with his hands held out with flying tresses and he's surrounded by the seven mothers, the sapta matrikas, on who, who attend upon him. It's a magnificent relief, one of the finest we have in South India of this date. And when you go towards the sanctuary where there is a linga, where you worship Shiva, on one side we have Varaha, who is the boar form of Vishnu, and on the other side we have Durga spearing the demon, the buffalo demon. Mahishasara Mardani, as she's called in Sanskrit. So again, this spectrum of different gods and goddesses in all of these temples, whether they're built or they're cut out of stone. Now, there are a number of other temples in Aiholi 
which are built in a style that is neither Dravida nor Nagara. And it's a very local style. And one way of describing it is call, to call it the Malprabha Valley style because it's confined to this part of South India. So the Malprabha Valley is a regional geographic term. And the interesting thing about these temples is that they have these sloping roofs. They have angled roofs like this. And between the stone slabs of these roofs are little pieces, that, little strips of stone that protect the joints. And you may ask, where does this type of roof come from? And my guess, it comes from timber and thatch. It's a sort of imitation of wooden architecture. And it's something which is unique to this part of India at this time. Now, the finest of these temples is called the Lad Khan Temple. Now, Lad Khan is the name of a, is a Persian-type name. And in fact, it's the name of a Muslim guy who was living in the temple at the end of the 19th century when the British first came to inspect, photograph, and measure the monuments. <clears throat> he was just squatting in the temple before they were protected. Mr. Ludkan, of course, is now long gone. The temple is dedicated to Shiva, and inside it's like an audience hall. There are huge columns supporting tiers of roofs like this, and there's a tiny little sanctuary dedicated to Shiva, with a linga in it, at the end. In the porch, before you go into the temple, there's a ladder, a stone ladder, that goes through a hole in the roof, and you can climb onto the roof and go to a small sanctuary, a little chamber, which is built on top of the roof of the temple. And this is a most unusual feature, and we don't have a clear idea of how this worked. But on the outer walls of this sanctuary, are different gods, Vishnu, Shiva, and probably Surya. So we're not exactly sure who this little sanctuary was dedicated to. So this is the Ludkarn temple. So we've described three important temples to you. Now there are other temples in the town of Aiholi which have these Nagara-style towers that I have already described at Patadakal and at Mahakuta with these Shikara curved towers. And these temples bear curious names like Chikagudi or Huchamaligudi, which don't mean much, they just describe the people who were perhaps squatting in the temples at that time. Now the Huchamaligudi temple, <coughs> which is just outside the town, is of considerable interest because it has three magnificent ceiling panels. So when you went into the temple and you looked up, you saw Vishnu reclining on the serpent, Ananta. And then you saw um, Shiva together with Parvati riding on Nandi, the bull. And then you saw Brahma surrounded by um, Brahmin priests. So this sequence of Vishnu, of Shiva, of Brahma shows you that all of the principal gods of the Hindu mythological spectrum were accommodated visually inside the temple. Now these ceiling panels of the Huchimaligudi are no longer in Aiholi. When the British first came there to inspect the temple they found these ceiling panels lying on the ground and they were so beautifully carved and they were in such good condition they felt they should be removed for safety. So if you go to Bombay, to what used to be called the Prince of Wales Museum, you will find them installed in the sculpture gallery, and they are the prize exhibits. They are in fact among the very few carvings from Aiholi which were taken away from the temple. Two more panels which were removed from Aiholi can be seen in the National Museum in Delhi. They show flying couples in the sky, surrounded by clouds. They come from the outer veranda of the Durga temple, and they are again among the finest sculptures to be seen in the, in the National Museum today. Other than these five or six pieces, there are no Chalukya sculptures from the 7th and early 8th centuries to be found in any other museums in India, nor elsewhere 
in the world, in Europe or the United States. And this may explain why the art of the Chalukyas is not as well known as it should be. This is quite unlike, say, Chola sculpture, because we have many bronzes from Chola temples. Because they are portable, they now grace the museums in India and in the West. So if you go to New York or London, people will have very little idea about Chalukya art. In order to get the best possible idea of what this great art was all about, you have to visit the Badami region. So, and this is something to be recommended. And these days it is much easier than it used to be because there's plenty of accommodation available in Badami where you can make easy trips, half an hour to Mahakuta, one hour to Patadakal, a little bit further to Aiholi. And you can reach Badami from Hubli where there is an airport only about an hour and a half away, or from Bangalore, and even from Goa, Hyderabad is further away. So we may ask, why are we interested in the Chalukyas of Badami and their temple architecture and their art? Why should we consider it? It is hard to overestimate the importance of this phase of Indian temple architecture. We know that temples were built in earlier times but we have almost no evidences of complete monuments. Here at Badami, Mahakuta, Aiholi and Patadakal, we have complete monuments filled with sculptures, all in fairly complete state of preservation. So from the late 6th to the middle of the 8th centuries, we have a complete spectrum of different styles, different images. So by studying the Chaluki architecture and the art, we get the best possible idea of the early evolution of Hindu and even Jain architectural and art traditions. The trouble is that you will all have to go to these places and see these wonderful monuments for yourselves. By visiting museums, it is not possible to get a correct idea of how these experiences are.